welcome. Welcome to this 44th annual Fuchs Study Day. And a very special welcome to those who are new to the Group Analytics Society International or have not been to one of our study days before. I'm Linda Watton. I chair the scientific program for Gassiet now, something that Sue did before me and talked me into. To be fair, none of us have been to a study day quite like this one. There are twice as many people as usual and from more different parts of the world meeting together online. But I recommend that you choose speak of you now so that you can see the speaker and any texts clearly. So that's in the top right hand bottom, <laughs> top right hand button in most people's screens. Uh, and as Peter said, if you keep your microphones off so that we don't have background noise interfering, you'll notice that we have closed captions or subtitles available if you'd like to use them. You use the arrow next to the CC button labeled live transcript to choose whether to show or hide the subtitles and you can adjust the size of the text by selecting settings. First, let me apologize to people joining us from the Eastern European time zone, Russia, Israel, Greece, Lithuania, and more for the error in the time chart that was on the web. As you can imagine, I spent many hours staring at that chart during the winter as we put the plans together for today's event, working out the timings in different parts of the world, where daylight saving applied and where it did not and so on. But it wasn't until late last night that someone spotted that one set of times was wrong and Julia sent out a correction from the office this morning. I'm so sorry for the confusion. Now yesterday, Sue Einhorn and Ronnie Levine started the conversation that we shall continue today about how internalized misogyny affects relationships between women. Sue told us that she wanted to refresh some of these ideas and concepts around this issue, to ask questions rather than to provide answers. She invited us to take a fresh look. So we've taken a rather different approach for this study day from the usual one, and have invited four women from different parts of the world to speak about the topic from their point of view, as a way of encouraging you to develop and share your own point of view during the course of the day. We have Shama Parke from India, Anna Tsapenko from Russia, Soraya Nayak from the UK, and Joanna, Joanna Skowronska from Poland. Let me just give you an outline of the day. Uh, I will just... Oh, I can't do that. see that. Uh, we will start with uh, two of the contributions, one from Shama and one from Anna, and then we'll have a little time for questions and comments. We'll then move into breakout rooms for randomly allocated leaderless reflection groups of about 12 people for more detailed discussion. And after a short break, we all meet again in the large group, convened by Marit joffe milstein and Peter Hutz. Then we have a long break of an hour, and you should stay, do stay connected to the Zoom room, it will make things easier. Just turn your microphone and video off if you go to get some refreshment. Then we reconvene and repeat the same pattern with two contributions, one from Soraya and one from Joanna, followed by a few comments and questions and back to the reflection groups in the breakout rooms. After a short break, we'll have another large group before we close the room, before we close, and the room will remain open for 15 minutes for farewells. The reflection groups last for 45 minutes and the large groups for 75 minutes. And I'll tell you more about the breakout room procedure when we get there. We're delighted that the topic has drawn so many of you and that the format has made it accessible for people from so many parts of the world. 
And while English is the language that allows us to communicate with each other, we have many people for whom English is not their first language. And I want to take this opportunity to remind myself and others to speak slowly, to allow more chance of being understood in this in disembodied Zoom state. I'm sure we're going to have a really interesting study day. And to start things off, I'm very pleased to introduce Shama Parke to you. Shama describes herself as a curious and passionate feminist mental health warrior. She has a keen interest in developing alternatives to conventional mental health practices. She believes that one's cultural and social systems are highly influential in one's development of mental health. It is therefore necessary, she says, to address the larger community and not just the individual in isolation. She co-founded the Hank Non Institute in Bengaluru in 2014 and is currently functioning as the clinical director. I'm very grateful to her for sharing her point of view with us today. So I'll turn my mic off and hand over to you. Thank you, Lindy. Am I audible? Great. I will get started. Sul animul, a Marathi phrase that has defined the purpose of a woman's life for centuries. In English, it translates to household and child care. Though this phrase was coined more than 100 years ago, it holds true even in today's modern India. A woman's life is structured within this framework, irrespective of her caste, social status, cultural background, educational qualification, and professional achievements. However, these factors decide how rigid or flexible this framework is. All this, while her male counterparts, most of them anyway, continue to excel in their chosen fields without having to worry about this framework. Some of you might say, but the times are changing. I agree, the times are changing, but for whom and in what way? One easy solution many modern families resort to is to focus on earning a living and hiring someone else to do the household chores and take care of their children. While it appears to be that simple, to me, it is one more way in which women are either pit against each other or remain socially submissive. If the woman of the house can't do it, bring in another woman from an underprivileged background. After all, she needs the money to feed her family. And then it is up to the woman of the house and the help to figure out how to work together, run the house and keep the man happy. Essentially, when women get married, they have to think about ways of being accepted and recognized by the help or the mother-in-law. Their relationship with their partners can take its own time. Despite this solution, many families continue to raise their children within the socially sanctioned gender roles. There is an unsaid social contract that says, you raise your daughters to be loving wives, capable homemakers and excellent mothers and we will raise our sons to be economically well-off and independent. Once again, this social contract applies irrespective of caste, social status, and cultural background. But here is what is most saddening, frustrating, and infuriating to me. More often than not, these rules and social contracts are enforced by women. The whole system is rigged. Where does one begin? What motivates women to do so despite all the pain? Is it hate? A woman I know pointed out how aggressive it is on the part of the mother 
to refuse to teach her son the basic life skills and ensure he is dependent on another woman for the rest of his life, thereby creating a situation where her daughter-in-law has no choice but to remain within the framework. Perhaps it is the same aggression that motivates the mother to adhere to the social contract by oppressing her daughter-in-law. Is this how mothers project their suppressed anger and rage onto their children? The last few weeks have been turbulent in more than one way. I have oscillated between feeling numb and overwhelmed as I hear about multiple deaths in the lives of people around me. Most of these deaths are a result of a flawed system. Moreover, the ritualistic ways in which we say goodbyes to those who have passed on have also disappeared. Dignity has been absent, not just in life, but even after death. How can I then spend my time and energy thinking about misogyny? There is so much more at stake than fighting over who does the dishes. But then is it just about the dishes? I think not. It is about dignity in everyday life for women. And this is a grave matter of concern pandemic or no pandemic. So here I am talking about misogyny and how I have internalized it. Sue's lecture left me with a flood of memories. There is a lot to say, especially because the checklist that defines a woman's self-worth is unending. Marriage, pregnancy, sex, motherhood, beauty, friendships, and the infinite capacity to endure, to name a few. No matter what we do, if we lack in any one of these aspects, that becomes the focus. We are then incomplete, or so we are told. It was a tough choice to make to focus on one or two of these aspects. So I chose to focus on something that has been quite alive for me in the recent past. The shadow pandemic of women's invisible labor I spoke about earlier and the persecution of self. The latter being one of the most tormenting, punishing and debilitating ways in which women internalize misogyny. In addition to Sue's question, of what are we doing to each other, I want to ask women, what are we doing to ourselves? I am most comfortable and alive when I speak from experience. However, as I was gathering my thoughts for today, I was aware of the critical chorus asking me why I am doing this. What is it that I'm trying to gain by exposing parts of me here? Do I want to seek attention? Do I want to be recognized? There's nothing new I have to say. These thoughts are an expression of my persecutory self. I often find myself fighting these voices when I'm about to do something significant. If you have experienced something similar, you can understand how discouraging and draining this process is. After all, we are walking against the tide. Every time a woman takes a step towards owning her space, voicing her thoughts, becoming a leader, this internal fear creeps in almost as a warning. Watch out. You are going to be punished for stepping outside the given framework. You will be ridiculed, ignored, judged, rejected, abused, or killed. Unless you try and be like a man. Do we need to be more masculine to be recognized? I wondered a lot about it once I cut my hair short two years ago. A woman I know said, well, if you are going to go against the norms and walk on an unconventional path, then you are going to suffer. That's what you should be prepared for. But then you don't have to do that. So many of us are content 
with having chosen the traditional ways of life. So why don't you? And I wonder, are they content? Or have they given up out of sheer tiredness? She goes on to say, I have waited many years. What do you do when people around you don't seem to care, don't acknowledge your needs? How long do I wait? There is only so much I can do in asking for what I need. So now I do all that I can in my capacity and ignore the rest. I simply want to lead a peaceful life. There's no point in fighting about who does what and how often. I have done it for so many years. I'm used to it now. I'm filled with sadness and rage at the same time as I hear this. I'm sad because I realize these unmet needs are not limited to household chores. It is also about her need to be seen, loved, acknowledged as a human, as a sensuous woman with desires to be her own person. And I'm enraged because of her choice to deny her needs and focus on enduring as much as she can. As I reach the end of this sentence, I wonder how often do I do this? How often do we choose loneliness over persistent fight? What do we do with the rage? Can we let it out of the secret cage without being labeled as an angry, irritable, grumpy woman? Rage is acceptable as long as it is contained within the goddess and mother earth. Sexuality is also acceptable as long as it is contained within the goddess and the sex worker. Mothers, daughters, and sisters are safe and respected as long as they are humble, modest, asexual beings who toe the line. That's my experience. You and I have experienced misogyny and internalized it long before we even learned the word. And yet we are here today attempting to explore and understand this complex experience. I believe this process of unlearning and relearning will continue for decades or even longer. And as we progress on this path, I wonder if we can begin to consider letting go of the need to be the best. The one need which in my experience has been the foundation of rivalry and jealousy between women. I say this because I feel the best mother, the best group analyst, or the best friend can't do what many good enough mothers, group analysts, and friends can. As I end, I would like to take a moment and thank Sue for inviting me to share my voice today. I would also like to thank Linda and the entire Fuchs Lecture and Study Day team for co-creating this invaluable space. I feel seen and recognized in being invited. And I'm fortunate to have women in my life. Many of you are here today who have seen me and helped me see myself as a strong, vulnerable, and compassionate woman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shama. That's one perspective. And we're going to move straight on to the second from Anna Topenko from Russia. Anna is a clinical psychologist, a training group analyst, supervisor, and director of the Moscow Institute of Group Analysis. She teaches in various training projects and organizations for mental health professionals, conducts an online large group for Russian speaking psychotherapists from different countries and countries and regions of Russia, and teaches a course on the social dreaming matrix. For more than 18 years, she's been leading the group analytical psychotherapy program for people with mental health problems and their relatives. Oh, I lost the last bit. So I'm going to ask you, Anna, if you will share your point of view. And I'm going to share my screen so that we can see your text and illustrations. So thank you so much, Anna.
Thank you, Linda. Uh, from a woman's perspective from Russia. Dear colleagues, I'm honored and pleased to come to contribute and respond to Sue's report. Thank you very much to Sue for inviting me and to organize this for presenting me this, with this opportunity. Misogyny and uh, looking through its prism at female relationships is a new topic for me and uh, has also been little explored in Russian psychology and group analysis. At the same time, CU offers a very interesting and promising approach, opening up a new way of thinking about ourselves, women, groups, society, and therapeutic process. The problems of the, of the woman described in the three-level model and the relationship with her mother and other, uh, other women in the family and friendships are easily identified in the experience of psychotherapeutic practice in cases where the relationships between mother and daughter has been disrupted. However, as far as I understood, or maybe I thought use point, misogyny is a universal social and psychological mechanism inherent in the development of women in the conventional norm uh, in patriarchal world. And all of us women have internalized through identification with the mother, the <clears throat> protective attitude to suppress our desires and conform to the social norms of patriarchal society. I think the degree of misogyny and forms of its manifestation in every, in every particular woman depends on foundation metrics, on family culture, as well as her psychic maternity. Since the foundation metrics of patriarchy actualized our highest experience in us, it is important in what mental structure they arise and how well the psych copes with them. I associate uh, the critical holes with the pre oedipal superego, the rigidity of which depends on availability of good experience that can neutralize the critical voices, retain the connection with good objects, keep the love and acceptance of the self. If this is successful, it is possible to cope with feelings of envy, jealousy, hatred, and to develop good relationships with women, with women to feel intimacy and warmth. Social historical context. Russia has always been and remained a patriarchal country with the Tsar father in pre-revolutionary years the father of nations in the USSR, the president in the modern Russian Federation. The maternal figure of the social level has at all times been associated with personified image of Russia, Mother Russia, Mother Russian ground, motherland, uh, socialism. Uh, Russia has always been Oh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> After the 1970s uh, revolution and overthrow of Tsarism, equal rights for men and for women and men were proclaimed, which was great progress for the time. In practice, however, this generally led to an overburdening of women which, uh, with both female and male responsibilities. In the patriarchal structure of society, the patriarchal structure of society was modified but maintained. Women became helpers of the state in the construction of socialism, a labor resource, as the labor role of, we, of women was extolled and as equal to that of men. The approach often led to one side development, the sublimation, sublimation of libido into work and love to come of country, 
the suppression of sexuality, the infantilization of women in the sex of childish and masculinized position. Often one could hear the attitude of all the women towards the young, that one should study, become a good specialist, get a good job, and then get married one day. <clears throat> it can wait, the valuation of relationships. At the same time, sex before marriage was condemned in the Soviet Union. There was also an opposite attitude for girls. Study, work is not important. The main thing is to get well married. In between these extreme approaches, of course, there were intermediate forms, uh, more or less uh, taking into account the different needs of women. I have given examples of these uh, widespread parental and social attitudes in Soviet times to demonstrate how role models were set up, implying that women split into an independent worker or as being completely dependent on their husbands. In general, the social attitude of Soviet people is expressed by the words of popular song in the Soviet Union. There is a good tradition in the Komsomol family. Think of the motherland before you think of yourself. The shame of one's desires stems stemming from this attitude is in one way or another still relevant today. Social trauma. Another important factor that had a huge impact on the social development of women in Russia should be noted. These were the losses of men in the two wars, the Civil War 1917 to 1922, and the Great Patriotic War, Second World War, uh, 1941 to 1945. Women were left alone with often children in their arms in the face of enormous social uphill during the war and the post-war dev devastation and farming. The grief of self-detachment uh, combined with the need of cope with, uh, of cope with everything alone and the fact that the lives of families in several generations were shaped uh, differently by the loss of a husband, father, grandfather, son, or brother, is a social traumatic experience whose consequences have yet to be fully understood. I think that this social reality has brought uh, with it the experience of both helplessness and omnipotence, the belief that a woman can cope with everything on her own. At the same time, at the level of the social metrics in Russia, there is a yearning for a male figure, which is often evident in the predominantly female analytical groups. At times, this is a longing for an idealized heroic figure of a husband, a father, who will protect against all calamities. In the absence of men, grandmothers help the daughters uh, raise, uh, raise their children and there is a lot of intergenerational help. Family context. To give you an example, uh, let me briefly talk about some aspects of the relationships between women in my family. Mom and dad were loving, responsible parents. Both worked. Dad worked and earned more. Mom was more dedicated to, to the family. Generally followed the traditional division of roles and responsibilities, but not rigidly. Dad was able to help mom and her housekeeping tasks when necessary, and they both took care of us, the children, a lot. Mom supported me me and my sister in our <clears throat> female roles, studies, and social achievements to the extent of matching her security experience. When my work required more visu visibility to the state, to society, than matches my mother's idea of security, <clears throat> my mother became frightened. I realized at some point 
that to succeed in my work, I needed to become the bad daughter to my mother. As good daughters behave safely. It was important that my father supported me, supported my goals. In the aftermath, my mother was proud of me. I know that a lot of Russian women experience similar difficulties. I help my clients with the awareness of this conflict, which leads to an end to women's self-sabotage, as you mentioned in her report, and to greater fulfillment. What do dreams tell us? I will conclude with the example from the social dream matrix uh, that sheds some light on the nature of misogyny relationships between women and the contents of level three, the secret cage of emotions. At the Moscow Institute of Group Analysis, the course of dreaming in group psychotherapy was led in cycles, which includes a weekly social dream matrix. We will talk about two uh, social genetic sessions in different groups, which took place in 2016 and 2017. The dynamics of both meetings were related to the theme of initiation as a transition from one state to another, from adolescence to adulthood, turning a girl into a woman, a young man into a man. In these meetings, only women were present. The few men in the group keep the sessions, experiencing uh, the theme of initiation outside the group, which is typical for male initiation. In one group, <laughs> the dreams had a similar theme. The women dreamt of maniacs who they were able to fight back and then dreamt that they were in contact with men. In the reflection, it was understood that the women felt the power to protect themselves, their boundaries, and felt that contact was not destructive and it was possible to enter into it. At the same time, it was important to have a transitional state, symbolically reminiscent of the ancient Russian custom, of giving a girl in marriage. On the eve of the wedding, the bride was dressed and prepared for the ceremony by her nanny mothers, all the women helping her to prepare psychologically to her, to her new status and mourn the separation from her parental family. In another group, the dreams were filled with aggression and sexual attraction, and body parts were dreamt about. For example, there was a dream where the vagina went out and walked around town. In associations and reflection, uh, women uh, were arrived, uh, uni united, angry at men for all the wrongs and neglect of women at all times in all cultures and religions, uh, talked about terrorism, felt they were having a witch's coven in the absence of the men of the group and enjoyed, discussed archaic images of it and Lilith and the, in the context that Lilith, an equal female partner, was rejected by God and if created from Adam's Reef is dependent, is in a child like position, has no voice. The duality of the image of the mother in the, in the person of Lilith, Baba Yaga, it is which in Russian fairy tales who its kids. The witch was fantasized about. On the one hand, Anna, Anna mm -hmm. I'm aware we have haven't much time left, Anna. I wonder if you could perhaps move mm -hmm. to the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I will um, summarize. So this session, uh, uh, this session, uh, show that uh, female power is detached uh, bursting forth in dreams 
uh, it cannot be manifest, uh, manifested, it looks like a, a cavern. The image of the vagina uh, walking around the city was indicative of the detached female aggression and uh, has come out and is uh, protesting united women. It is important to know that on the day of the, this social gym session, uh, this, uh, there was a terroristic attack in Moscow, and uh, we learn about it later. There is no doubt that social uh, metrics open up access to unconscious social processes with which the group seems to have been in contact. What does it mean to break through detached female aggression and protest concerning the social context? Did the hatred relate to men or the maternal image of the social environment. Misogyny relates to split attitudes toward women. The detached parts appeared in dreams. To cope with misogyny, the integration of the parts is important. Thank you for, for your attention very much. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think, I hope people got the flavor of that social dreaming matrix. So thanks to both Shama and Anna. Uh, we literally have a very few moments for a brief comment or 